Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's retro review is 1987's Chaos Marauders, the manic game of orcish mayhem by Games Workshop. Okay, first a bit of history. Designed for 2-4 players, Chaos Marauders has had two editions, this one and a second edition that was published in 2009 by Fantasy Flight Games. The game is notable in its strong parallels to the German board game Ogallala that was released in 1977. Additionally, there were plans to release expansion sets for this version that were ultimately shelved. The cover features some classic art by John Blanche, who also illustrates everything throughout. Opening the box, we are greeted with a set of 16 sneaky git control markers, one cube of devastation, 112 colour cards that represent the troops, war machines, booty, etc. One basic rulebook. One complete rulebook. And four play sheets. These are laid out thus. and are where players place their cards. The object of the game is to complete three complete battle lines, but it's not that simple. There are five different types of cards. Blue cards are booty, things that the orcs have pillaged. These each have a victory point total. The person with the most victory points at the end of the game is the winner. There are various ways to accumulate these points, more on that later. Green cards are special items, groups or individuals that affect play in unusual ways. Playing or discarding a green card ends your turn. There are grey cards. These depict the lesser goblinoid units and don't give any victory points, but can be useful for other reasons. There are purple cards. These are the regular troops. The card displays their name, clan symbol, and attack rating. More on attack rating later. The clan symbol is important in that you cannot have two of the same clan symbol on the same battle line at the same time, with one exception. If this is the case when you draw your card, then you discard it and your turn ends. Finally, we have red cards. These are war machines and come in multiple parts. These cards have both an attack rating and a victory point total. If you draw the crew of a war machine, you can take any part that other players may have. To begin play, the players mutually decide who should go first, and that player starts drawing cards and plays them on their playsheet. This continues until you draw a turn-ending card, which is usually green, or a card that you can't play due to it being a repeated card on any of the three battle lanes. Turn-ending cards are resolved there and then. Cards are to be placed into the boxes and on the playsheet, assembling a battle line, and they can't be repositioned when they've been laid down. All battle lines should begin with a standard bearer and end with the musician. These are the only cards that can go to the extreme ends of the sheet. A battle line may be of any length, as long as it has a minimum of 4 cards in it, and no longer than 16. A line with less than 4 cards is considered incomplete, as is one with gaps in it. You can only have one of each of these two in any single battle line. The standard bearer does not have to go on the left hand side end, they can start midway, but the musician must always go to the right of it with a gap of at least two cards. When you draw a green card, you resolve the effect of it and then pass your turn on to the next player. Similarly, drawing a card that you really don't want to play allows you to discard it and end your turn. Play continues like this until somebody completes three full battle lines, whereupon the game ends and victory points are awarded based on a list of criteria such as the length of the lines, the amount of booty, the amount of complete war machines, etc. But getting to that point is just not that simple. At any point that a player completes a battle line, they can decide to attack one of a fellow player's incomplete battle lines. To do this, the player adds up the combined attack ratings of their cards. If it is higher than their intended target's line, they roll a cube of devastation. If one of the five orc eyes are rolled, the attacking player takes all of the cards from the defeated player's incomplete line, purple are killed and discarded, and they add the rest to their own lines, discarding any that they don't want. Should the mark of chaos be rolled, however, the attacking player's line, in typical orcish fashion, loses courage and routes. The attacking player's purple and grey cards are killed and discarded, and everything else is taken by the defending player. Although this may look quite simple, there are a number of cards that throw an orc-sized spanner into the works. For example, if a player draws the Chaos Marauders card, they go ahead and place it on their line, hoping nobody notices, as the first player to shout, Chaos Marauders, before their turn end, gets control of the card, and the turn immediately goes to them, regardless of who was supposed to be next. The turn-ending green cards have a wide range of effects. The two most prominent ones are the Sneaky Git and the Venomous Creep. The Sneaky Git is placed on one of your opponent's battle lines under your control and allows them to cause the victim to discard a card that they have drawn. These can be played multiple times in single lines. Venomous Creeps allow you to steal a card from someone's line and add it to your own. 
Other green cards have wild game-changing effects such as Skyer's Blowback, a Skaven Warp Fire Thrower that allows you to wipe out a player's entire lane. However, if you roll the Mark of Chaos, it wipes your board of everything. Or Bilge Gut Rot, an Orcish Commander who allows you to rearrange your battle lines as you want, or even lead an incomplete line into battle. Or even Odd Lug Spleen Ripper, a stupid troll that each player has to roll the Cube of Devastation on to see if he joins their lines. Those that end up with him have a chance of their loot being eaten, but also gain a powerful warrior, and additionally, they have a chance that any sneaky gets that appear in their ranks are devoured before they can do anything. Should a player assemble three complete battle lines, the game ends and the victory points are added up. The longer the battle line, the more points you are awarded. You are also awarded them for the amount of cards you have, complete war machines, special booty, etc. I originally played this when I was 15 years old, and I loved it. I introduced my young daughter to Chaos Marauders, and within 30 minutes of wrapping her head around it, she was playing like a seasoned professional. The rules are really actually quite simple, with only the special cards requiring a bit of investigation, and to be honest, we had a blast. Just when you think you're moments from winning, the game will throw a curveball at you that can wipe out entire lines and even clean your board. There are definite tactics to the game, as it is a matter of judging when to make a move and when to settle, but there's a huge element of luck, not only in the draw, but in the rolling of the cube of devastation. And there's a definite chaos feel about the game, although this can make the game seem overly long, as you can see victory snatched from you on the brink by an unlucky die roll or someone else's draw. Additionally, you would need a pretty big table to play this with four players, as the play sheets are fairly large. The game has the feel of an 80s Games Workshop title, which I find incredibly comforting as it reminds me of simpler times, and a good complete copy can be picked up for around £25 on eBay, which is not prohibitively expensive. If you want a game that's easy to learn, but enjoyable enough that newcomers won't feel out of the league, then Curse Marauders is definitely something you should look at. I give it an 8 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other reviews. Also, if you enjoy what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.